So let's go into the ground of the of their habitat then. What was the substrate that you were fi finding in the wild? Um, so throughout pretty much that whole our whole survey area, um, it is what we call Australian red desert sand. It is sand, um, you know, and um, it's red because of the iron oxide, uh, but it's it's very much the typical outback sand that Australia has. Um, this was actually, I, I didn't know it was that much of an issue until I started going, okay, this is what I'm doing, and everyone's like going on about sand. So I actually had questions like inbox full, it's clay, right? It's not sand. It's hard packed. And I'm like, you know, I've been out to the center of Australia several times and it is, it's sand to me, but I'm no geologist. So, um, I actually collected some and I, I sent it away and it came back as pretty much 90% silica sand. Um, and you know, if we look at the evidence why they're ingesting sand, which is a normal inanimate part of their environment, and what's the reason for it, there must be something wrong. Um, in my veterinary career over 10 years in Australia, I would five to seven cases of sand ingestion like full on sand ingestion. Um, it's not high. Um, you know, whereas in countries like the US, um, I'm not quite sure. I've been told that the UK, it's pretty high. A lot of vets will see them in the UK as well. Um, they'll see a lot of sand ingestion and we just, you know, you have got to have a look at it. And so after hearing about this and looking back, I, you know, I look back at the cases. And, you know, this is going back a while and you look at it and every one of the cases is, uh, most of them were young growing animals, i.e. high calcium requirement, um, and poor UV. So we have, um, an animal that eats something that's unnatural. It's called pika. Unexplained reason. So you've got to look at it, you know, in every other animal, humans and other animals, it's nutritional deficiencies. It's, um, or psychological reason, you know? Um, yeah, sure. So it leaves you really two options there is really, you know, nutritional imbalance, which let's be realistic. The ones I've seen. They weren't under proper UV. They were under things that said would have UV. But now that I think about it, where they were basking, it was pretty much zero UV. Um, they're fed um, things with high phosphorus, not getting enough calcium. So they want to try and ingest something to get the calcium. Um, and then, you know, and obviously, you know, they're the, they're the animals that are going to start ingesting sand. There's a study done um, at the uh, Vet Med University in Vienna and paired with, um, they worked with uh, Bruno in the Czech Republic and some other private clinics. And they looked at the amount of sand ingestion in um, captive um, bearded dragons that presented. And in over half the cases show indications of metabolic bone disease um, and parasites. So there's husbandry problems going on there right away. So, um, you know, we've we got to look at underlying reasons why they're ingesting sand. Um, and I'm looking back at it now, I put the small number of cases, I look at, go, okay, metabolic bone disease is the cause most of the time um you know i saw a lot more animals that are um have you know impacted with food um and problems there um but you know 
it's one of those myths or symptomatic treatments. It's eating sand. Let's put no sand. We're not, we're not solving the problem. We're just ignoring the real cause of the problem. And if you look at, you know, the way they've, they're kept, you know, in, in other countries, like in Australia, we, we know to, it's always been told, yep, take them out into the sun. That's not a problem. Even in the middle of winter, you've got enough UV for a bearded dragon if you take them out. Um, whereas in, you know, US, UK, Europe, there's no winter sun. Um, you know, whether you can take them out in the sun's another thing. So, um, you know, so it's, it's a very, uh, hot topic. A very, you get, you know, people that are quite, quite, uh, passionate about it. And, but we, we need to look at it because, you know, it's, you look at the reasons for it and what we can do. And, but also knowing it's a natural part of the environment and we know they dig. And if you don't have the sand there, um, or the loose substrate, then you're depriving your animal. And we, you should go, okay, if you don't want to keep it with that, which is a big part of their what they like to do, whether you're providing the best welfare for them. So you described it being like 95% sand in a while, known like 2% clay. Uh, we both keep on just like the quartz play sand. Uh, do you have any experience just keeping on just pure sand for bearded dragons in that way? Um, I've been lucky enough. Um, I was dug sand from the arid region <laughs> that That's was literally cheating. the sand and you <laughs> stick it in and then you pour a whole bunch of water on it and it sets it sets and they can dig a burrow into it um and it's it's it can be quite fine it's, there's a lot of dust you get a lot of dust out of it um i know a lot of keepers um do keep um on quartz sand and they're those animals i, I do remember doing enemas with large amounts of just normal quartz kids play sand coming out of it. Um, you know, it's it's hard for me to recommend. Like, I can't, I've never seen one impacted with red desert sand, but, you know, it might just because no one had access to it as much. Um, but having them on sand, um, you can add clay to it to bond it. So it is like out in the wild, like, you know, it's not, a hard and fast rule. Um, what they do like doing is digging a burrow into the sand. So, or into the substrate. So if you can get a substrate like quartz and then add some clay to it. So it does have the opportunity to, to build a burrow, um, and dig through it. Then you providing, you know, it, the opportunity to perform an actual behavior, which is one of the five freedoms, um, uh, animal welfare. So. Yeah, um, we, I tend to like provide like a, like, like a log over or like a cork round over like a deep patch of sand. And my dragon tends to like dig out a gap beneath it. So I was like, okay, she's getting to dig a little bit. But yeah. That's very typical of what we see out in the wild. Um, that's what their escape burrows are like. Um, or some of them even dug, dig their rumination burrows up a log like that. So yeah, that's very much ideal for creating um you know allowing them to create uh, to perform a natural um behavior so. do you think the no substrate uh ethos plays a role in like arthritis and bit of dragons on joints and stuff like that so it's yes uh yes somewhat when we look at Using no substrate, you have an animal that's not active because it's not digging. So it loses muscle mass and it relies on carrying its weight purely on its bones and joints. Whereas if you have an animal with substrate that can dig and has a lot better muscle mass, a lot better condition, it's not going to be as overweight, not going to be as obese, so there's a lot less stress on the joints because, you know, the muscles are there to support the bones and the tendons, the joints, 
um, by using no substrate, you're, you don't give them the opportunity for that physical activity, which is a welfare issue. It's going to sit there, become this fat dragon that has no muscle mass, so it's more stress on its joints. Um, you know, we look at, you know, wild dragons, uh, you know, they're mixed martial artist fighters, they're tough and toned. And then you look at bearded dragons in captivity and they're, you know, hatch potatoes. So, you know, it's, it's, it's worlds apart. We've, we've, you know, we're, we're not, we're not doing favors for them, um, by keeping them like that. We're not doing favors by not providing them with things to dig, not providing things for them to climb. Um, they're super active animals out in the wild. Um, you know, if you put them in something with no environmental enrichment, nothing to do any activity, um, their bodies are going to waste away, just like a person that sits there and does nothing. They're not going to be a peak of health. They're going to have problems getting up and so on and stuff like that. The clip you've just watched is just a snippet of a larger podcast episode where we had Bearded Bear on the podcast. If you want to find the full podcast episode, you can find that up here. Or if you want to carry on looking through the Bearded Bear Explained series, you can find the rest of it down here.